I wasn't able to go to university straight after school. I hadn't got the money. And so I started off at UNISA, University of South Africa, which I still regard as a wonderful institution because if it were not for it, I would probably still be a bank clerk or something like that. I started at the um, uh, studying part-time at um, UNISA, and um, my idea then was to go on with law. I thought it was a good occupation, and um, I thought I, I'd done very well in language at school and all that sort of thing, and I think, thought law would be a, a good idea. And um, I thought, first of all, I'd major in English, which was the obvious thing because I'd done so well in it. Um, and then psychology, which I didn't know very much about, and I thought, well, it had helped me understand the way people think. But I saw English and psychology at that stage as subsidiary to um, profession in law. Then I went on, and I found my undergraduate studies in law moderately interesting, but... Um, very long, drawn out, went on for a long time. And to cut that story short, eventually I thought that perhaps one of the other areas might go ahead. I also had academic interest all the time. I always wanted to go into academia. I thought it was a nice life, dealing with civilized people and um, um, people you can talk to in the common room, that sort of thing. So um, I finished my UNISA degree, and then I went to... Natal University, and I was still thinking of of um, academia, and I actually went on with an English honours degree, a set of psychology honours. At the end of the year, I thought I'd done a bit of research by then, which I should have done earlier, and I wasn't sure whether that was the right thing. So that's where the NIPR comes in. I knew somebody who was working at the NIPR, um, that's Wendy Winter, who later became my wife. She'd spoken quite often about the NIPR, and we were just friends at that stage. So I went to the institute. I knew they did vocational counselling, and um, I saw Henry Fabian, a um, very tough-minded man. And I said, you know, I'm not sure to do this or that or the other. And he said, well, there's no real way to decide. We can't give you a test that will say whether you should go on with English or on with psychology, why not come and join us and you'll find out for yourself? <laughs> so I joined him in his department. I was offered, I was interviewed by two or three people. There were vacancies in other departments. And I joined um, uh, Personal Selection and Vocational Guidance, the department was called. And I worked along with, uh, uh, with Henry Fabian and Hilton Blake and a couple of other people there. And I um, was pretty happy there for a year or so. Then Johanski had a vacancy in psychometrics, and I'd become very interested in it. And that came about because um, we were doing the Navy selection project, and um, they wanted extra manpower to calculate and draw O drives. They asked me to do these, and um, I got talking to Johan, and he said, well, if you ever want to come and join my department, you can. And I did. And I spent the rest of my time in that department. Um, people who I thought were important um, to me was Johan, because um, I didn't have a very good knowledge or understanding of um, psychometrics at that time. And um, I, uh, I couldn't even do a product moment correlation or even a, um, a, a Spearman's difference um, rank difference correlation, I sort of knew about them, but didn't really. <laughs> I mean, it, it's bizarre to think of it now. That was the level of psychometric ability that they turned people out with an undergraduate degree within those days. Um, I want to go back to my training because it's markedly different, markedly different from today. Um, I think... Obviously, I didn't know everything about every university, but I know quite a lot about the history of UNISA, of Natal, and to some extent, WITS. And they were all, it was before the big behavior modification um, fad, as I call it, came in, and it was all very psychoanalytically orientated. We had to read Freud in translation, not what other people have written about him, but the actual straightsheet translations of Freud, you had to be able to answer um, about the 
introductory lectures versus the new introductory lectures, how Freud had changed his mind in 1916, heavily psychoanalytic. It was very much a verbal, um, word-orientated, if that's the word, process of tuition in those days. There were experimental psychologists, but they were, I think they were a rarity, really. The people who were aiming to go out into the world were doing the, the Freud-type course. There was no registration of psychologists when I qualified. Uh, that came in a couple of years later. And um, although SARPA, the Psychological Association, um, had categories of industrial, counselling, clinical and so forth, you more or less chose your ca category according to um, what training you'd done after your degree. But basically your bachelor's, honours and master's degrees were pretty general. So it is a very different world and I do think I think it applies to most of the universities that there is a, not a very strong psychometric or even research orientated um, basis except for the people who went in for um, white rats and that sort of thing. There's a story about my former professor, Professor Ronnie Albino, and um, he sent a telegram to Honestapurt, who used to be, breed the rats, and said, um, please send 200 uh, Albino rats, signed Albino, Natal University. They didn't send them because they thought it was a send-up. They thought it was a joke. <laughs> albino asking for Albino rats, that sort of thing. Anyway, back to the Institute, I joined it, very happy there, met my, I got to know Wendy better, married her. Um, Johannes, I said, was a big influence on me. Um, Helmut Reuning was an important influence just generally. Professor Bieshevel I only got to know after, because he just left, as we know, he left on political grounds, for all that they said about the, or that people may say today about the Institute being right-wing, that's very, very far from the truth. It was, it was a very left-wing organisation and it was under a lot of pressure by the then government um, to toe the line and eventually Professor Beesel, Dr. Beesel, as he was then, left because he couldn't handle it. We all know that. And uh, host came in, he didn't last long. And then Forster, they were the only ones I knew at that time. So I spent about four years there. Those people influenced me. Um, but Beeseville's legend uh, was very strong. It really ran right through the Institute. And, um, of course, he wrote a, a book which was published by the SA Institute of Race Relations called African Intelligence, which was an answer to a book whose full title I can no longer remember, but I think it was called The Intelligence of the South African Bantu, which was published by... Uh, some, I think, government-based organization whose name I forget. And um, B. Seville's point was that you can't damn an entire group of people who have not had a appropriate um, educational background to prove their intelligence. So that apart from the fact that you cannot make conclusions about national intelligence, which you can't even do today, it is even more inappropriate to make them then when the majority of the people who they were saying were less intelligent were in fact less educated as well. Um, if I have a sideline with Professor Beesevel for a while, he went on to become, um, a, um, the, as far as I'm aware, the first human resources or personnel, as we said then, man, uh, to be on the actual board of directors. And he was on the board of directors of the breweries, and I think that it was he who more or less brought HR into the limelight in this country. And no country needed it as much because we've got such a wide spectrum of, of, of races and types and that sort of thing. So um, I think his contribution to human resources is invaluable. I think few people realize how strong it was. So he retired from the institute, he then retired from the breweries, and then he took his third job as um, director of the Graduate School of Business Administration at WITS. And um, I, I knew him also through his other world because he's a very important member of the Mountain Club. Mm -hmm. And a little tribute to Simon B. Sewell is that when he died, he had two papers in press. One was on mountaineering and one was on human resources. He published all the day beyond the day he died in a funny way.
I worked on various projects there. I was working on the Air Force and Navy projects, selection of, of would-be officers and that sort of thing. Had a great deal of fun going down to um, Simonstown and Soldana. That was very interesting. Um, I've still got photographs of the um, midshipmen at the Navy doing their um, uh, various tests, uh, which might be of some interest. And it was very interesting to do that. Um, I was then put on to a project to evaluate the new road signs. The road signs that you see around you here were only brought into this country in the mid-60s. Before that, we had a completely different type of road sign. And uh, what the National Institute for Road Research did was they put the new type of sign up without purpose, but where there would have been another sign. Speed limit sign, they put the new one, or a curve sign. And then they stationed a traffic officer and me a few hundred yards beyond. Traffic officer got out, went out, held up his, his arms, said, stop, guy, what, what have I done now, sort of thing. So this is just an experiment. Then I would ask them, did they see the sign? Had they reacted to it? So before these road signs were introduced into this country, there quite a lot of research went on. And um, eventually it was, a, it was accepted that they were universally acceptable. The, um, all um, cultural groups seemed to be able to understand them just as well. There's nothing arcane or odd about them. So that, that came about. Um, most of the time at the Institute, your main interest was trying to get enough money together to avoid starvation. We were terribly badly paid. When I, years later, I wanted to buy back into my pension, and the amount of money that um, I was paid was something I could very easily remember. It was 1,760 rands per annum. It was a different rand then. Um, I never forgot that figure because it's the number of yards in a mile. And um, that gives you an idea. And you could just more or less manage. You know, there's some... Some of us used to bless the fact that we had these white coats issued by the Institute because underneath it <laughs> was not very respectable, old, ragged clothing in many of our cases. So after four years, I moved over to the Chamber of Mines. They offered me a better job, better pay. In many ways, I'd have liked to stay at the Institute. In fact, in all ways, I'd have liked to stay there except the, the money thing. Um, at the... Chamber of Mines, I was working on underground safety um, and other things. I had two big projects. One was to, to um, standardize and validate the tests that had been devised by the NIPR for the Chamber of Mines. If one can go back a bit, I don't know whether older people than me um, have spoken about this, but one of the big early products of the NIPR was the general adaptability battery for selecting um, semi-literate um, workers in the mining industry. Those tests had become invalid, not because of the inherent um, lack of ability to, to discriminate, but because they were too widely known. And uh, there were even schools in Mozambique where they taught people to do well on the tests and that sort of thing. So the Institute excuse me, had been um, asked to devise a new set of tests and one of my big jobs was to um, standardize them. I was in the fortunate position that I had an almost unlimited budget and something that very few people, test producers, can do to standardize. I was given a test center. I was given a whole cohort of people. Um, there weren't people that that particular mine even wanted. We selected them on certain psychometric grounds, square distribution, um, with more poor people and more good people than the distribution would allow in order to allow for the appropriate statistics. And they were trained and then they were tested and that sort of thing and then they went off to their various jobs. We got a um, test retest correlations of over 0.9 but we got a validity correlation of 0.9. It I think is unusually good. Um, there are people in my field, in our field, who say if you get a validity of 0.9, you've made a mistake. But I think this is genuine because of the 
quality of the tests and the quality of the of the validation study. My other big project was underground um, safety. Not a tremendous number of avoidable accidents in the mines. If if you have a rock fall or something and it hits people, it's bad luck. It's can't, not much can be done about it. But the biggest accidents were underground trains. Underground train um, might have seven to ten tons of rock on it. It only goes at about eight miles an hour, but it's not easy to stop. And if it comes off, there's a catastrophe because all sorts of facilities are damaged, you see, and people can be killed. So I had a little team, and I had a guy, and every time we were sort of like vultures. Every time there's an accident, he popped off downstairs, down below, and he took photographs and that sort of thing, and we were trying to develop tests to prevent accidents. We instituted things like um, 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 tachographs to see how effectively the locomotives were worked. And as an example of how research gets dis- disappears, about less than three years ago, and we're talking about my research being in the 60s, about three years ago, I happened to be sitting at a table with a woman uh, at a wedding somewhere and... Um, said, what are you doing? And she said, she's working for the Chamber of Mines. Oh, that's interesting. I used to do that. What are you working on? Underground safety. So I said, have you read my paper so-and-so and so-and-so? No, never heard of them. What's your name? I gave them my surname. Never heard of you. Oh, what are you doing at the moment? Well, we're considering putting tachographs on locomotives. So I said, I suggest that you read my paper, The Use of Tachographs in the Prevention of underground accidents in locomotives, which are published in 1967. She said, for Christ's sake, don't tell the chamber about that, or they'll cancel my contract. <laughs> so there we are. Research gets done again and again. Um, from a personal point of view, I want to talk about the South African Psychological Association. It's a much maligned institution. First of all, there was and later politically motivated people in the psychological field maintain that it was a, an apartheid institution. This is simply not true. What did happen was that, as I understand, it was before my time, it would have been perhaps late 50s, which was a very difficult time in terms of apartheid and the government. And a black guy did apply to join the association and he was refused by the committee. However, current people are always telling us that that was typical of the old Sapa. As I understand it from Professor Albino and Professor Mann, the people who actually founded that association in 1946, that was immediately overturned by the membership, and Sapa became a non-racial um, organization. Didn't have many black psychologists, because there weren't many black psychologists. Um, I don't remember when I was at the Institute whether we had any actual MA psychologists uh, who were black. I can't remember. I don't think we did. It wasn't a discipline that they'd moved into at that stage. So I became pretty involved with SAPA, um, and I became um, um, publication coordinator of the Publications Committee, ran a little newsletter, but the biggest, founder, biggest thing that I think I did was that along with Professor Albino, I founded the Essay Journal of Psychology, which is still going. So the two of us founded that. He was um, scientific editor, I was managing editor. It was, belonged to SAPA, and SAPA paid for it for a few years until the um, CSIR decided that they could pay for it because the, it was beyond SAPA's um, budget to pay for it. And I think that's a step that was taken in those days, which was important. As far as my own career is concerned, I left um, Chamber of Mines, left research. I was a senior research officer by then, and um, joined the um, Wits University and was asked to found a counselling and careers unit. And I did that. They sent me overseas. Um, They'd been thinking about it already, and they'd done a lot of uh, preliminary research writing to well-known universities, they sent me over to Britain, later on to America, and coming back, I started the Counselling Careers Unit, which dealt with students' problems, um, personal problems, but also 
vocational indecision and um, kids who were coming into the university. And eventually we started a sort of um, um, assembly line system, as it were. We tested a large number of people on a Saturday morning, interviewed them during the week, and I think that by and large we did quite a good job there. Um, I was offered uh, another position as head of a student counselling service which had a bit more prestige in my, my my little world at Maritzburg University. It was the oldest established and it had membership of Senate, that sort of thing. And I stayed at Maritzburg for quite a long time and then just before I, five years before I retired, I um, came back to Witz and I got a teaching post in the Department of Psychology teaching the vocational counselling side of industrial psychology and that's what I was doing when I left Wits. I realised that there'd be a need to earn a living after I left Wits and um, I managed to get some contacts in the field of personal injury lawyers and I'm now doing mainly personal injury work, assessment of work future but for the accident and having regard for the accident and writing the report. Fairly routine level but you have to be able to defend every single word you say in court against cross-examination. So it's not an occupation I'd recommend to the faint-hearted or to the young. That's a sort of a summary of my career. N-E-O-A-C, five-factor, five openness to experience. I'm sure that that's number one. Um, you've got to be able to move into other people's worlds. Um, when I was trained in counselling, when I trained people in counselling, we used to put unpleasant situations to them where we knew they were going to make a judgment. In, intrinsic, implicit judgment. Implicit is the word I really want. And then say, why did you make that judgment? What in you made you make that judgment? That sort of thing. That's the first one. The second, of course, is good listening ability, which I think is part of that. If you're not open to experience, then you can't, you can't listen to other people. You've got to be able to move into other people's worlds, whether you are an industrial psychologist or a clinical or counselling psychologist. Leave research out of it for the moment. Um, openness to experience seems to be an important aspect, as I've said. E.K. Strong, who's the author of one of the oldest um, interest inventories and a very, very good one, perhaps the best that there is, it is the most researched psychological instrument around, according to Buros, the um, psych Mental Measurement Yearbook. And um, he said that when he noticed that psychologists tended to score high on introversion, he said, well, the psychologist is not really very interested in people. But I think that he was looking at a sample of academic psychologists. I think that if you're not interested in people, then fine, go and do your psychometric research or your... Um, uh, ethology, animal research sort of thing but the majority of psychological work is around human beings and if you're not interested in them you shouldn't be doing it I think you've got to be good at your home language you've got to have a, a fluency and a feeling for the subtleties of language why a person chose this particular sentence rather than another one I think that's important as well um, and I think in all modesty, you've got to be fairly bright. If you're not at least as good, as, as bright as your client, he's going to pick it up pretty soon. So I think those are, to me, the important things of modern psychology. I think that psychology in the 30s, 40s, I don't know much about that, but the history... I mean, I was studying in the 50s, and what they called abnormal psychology. They didn't use the term clinical psychology. We had Maslow and Mittelmann, I think it was, um, a coursework, course book in abnormal psychology sort of thing. And um, a phrase that could have a very double-edged meaning was that there was a discipline within psychology called people could be abnormal psychologists. <laughs> That's a double-edged, a two-edged sword, that one, you know. So I think that's my answer to that question. I don't think that cross-cultural psychology was very strong 
um, when I started. It was getting going. There was Rooney's ex expeditions to the Bushveld, uh, to the Kalahari, which were, um, I think, very significant. There's the International Year of Man or something. I can't remember the exact title. 1967, when a lot of money was put into cross-cultural. Uh, I speak very subject to correction because it's not my field. Um, that is the sort of work that Roining and Wendy and and um, the Dutch guy, um, Ipe, Ipe Pertinga, um and a few others who I forget now were doing. Um, I think it was important work. I don't... I think the Institute... The time I met it um, didn't have a very strong cross-cultural um, um, expertise. I think it has only started coming in in the, the late 60s. Remember, I joined in 64, which is a long time ago. Um, clinical psychology, which is something I read about but don't do, um, seems to have moved away from the psychoanalytic uh, model to a large extent. And I think it's a move towards uh, cognitive behavior therapy and that sort of thing. All I know is that when I read the journals today, CBT is um, the most commonly men mentioned um, um, therapy, possibly because it's offered in hospitals, and hospitals have got a uh, limited amount of time. I mean, Freud wrote an uh, essay, psychoanalysis, terminable or interminable, and it's a good point because some people do go on forever. Um, in, my, in our field, industrial psychology, I think the measures <clears throat> have become much more sharp. Um, we've got much sharper measures than we used to have. Um, some of the personality theories that were going when I started my profession in psychology, I remember one of them, uh, an interest inventory that I was given as a test um, when I was a youngster, um, and years later um, I saw a, state, uh, saw a study on it which said that it resolved into two factors. It gave eight scores, but there were only two factors. Then there's the Bernreuter. Uh, that was a personality inventory. That ended up by having very little validity. So there's measures that were still in use in the 60s when I joined the, uh, the profession um, were a little bit on the blunt side. And I think a lot of measures are much more useful today. And also, in many cases, they take less time. And then there's those ones that skippers were so keen on, um, uh, ability measures where computer moderated so that if you answered a particular question, you shifted onto a higher level very quickly instead of going through all the easy ones till you got to the difficult ones. Like Raven's 60-item um, uh, matrices. I mean, the first 20 items um, are really wasting your time. And people tend to, if you're bright, people then lose um, uh, concentration. They get a couple wrong in the first two columns and it takes their scores off the top and it gives the impression they're not as good as they really are. So with that type of computer-moderated one, I think that's been a tremendous step forward, yeah. When I was teaching at Witz my last few years' work, there was a distinct feeling that clinical psychology was the thing, that the clinical psychologists were the cream of the cream, and they had a very high opinion of themselves. I was on the selection committee for clinical psychology, and I know that for our 10 places, we got about 80 applicants in writing. Just on their written um, applications, we got them down to about 25. We then interviewed them and we finally got them down to 10. As a consequence, the 10 who survived thought there was something rather special. 10 years later, they're not working in clinical psychology. It's, I think it was Fliess, um, Freud's correspondent Fliess, who said psychoanalysis is not a profession, it's a disaster. I hope I'm not misattributing it. Clinical psychology... Um, youngsters should be very careful before they embark in the field of clinical psychology. They go there full of um, altruistic ideas about healing and all that sort of thing. And they, a few years later, they, they've burnt out. 
Um, and so that's one piece of advice I'd give people. Um, obviously, if they want to have a reasonable income, industrial psychology is, is the field because you make more money. Uh, that sounds like wealth. You have a better chance of making a reasonable income in industrial psychology than in any of the other fields because there's such a demand for people in the field. I think those are the two things that I would advise most. But I would advise a lot of people to consider their motivation very carefully before they go into um, any, of, any of the helping professions, uh, clinical psychology, counselling, social work, which is not what we're talking about now, but um, a lot of young people, particularly young women, altruistic, um, have a, a belief that they could do something about the improving the world. And of course, you can't. <laughs> it sounds negative, but you can't. I think I regret not having been able to study overseas. Um, during one of my sabbaticals, I went off um, to the United Kingdom and I worked there for a sabbatical. They offered me a job, um, but there were compelling family reasons why I could not stay over in the United Kingdom. I've always regretted having to come back here. Um, I think that I would have learned a lot more. Um, there's all sorts of, of... The intellectual world is, is um, more with you there. Um, I'll give you a practical example. Just the other day I was looking at a particular book... Um, um, so it's referenced, I looked it up, I thought I'd like to get it. It's 1,400 rands, start off with. Um, then I thought, how, the, how am I going to get it? Um, shall I go to Amazon.com? I've heard that they won't deliver to South Africa because of the post office, da 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 When I was at a British university, one day I thought, I want a um, uh, specimen copy of a particular book, I might prescribe it. Phoned up the publishers, brought it around at 9 o'clock the next morning. That's the difference. I read the book, I said, yes, I think I will use it. I prescribed it. That is what I'm getting at. Everything you want is at your fingertips. Um, British universities are not as wealthy as American universities, but they've got so much more money, so many more facilities, but a, a hotter intellectual climate than we've got. I know that sounds denigrating of my own colleagues, but it's a, it's a more demanding um, climate which keeps you, more, keeps you sharper and more um, alert in your own profession. Um, I think that's one of the things that I regret. And I think, although I've just been almost denigrating clinical psychology, I might have gone into research on therapy. Not a therapist, but research on the process of therapy at a British university. It doesn't exist here. There's no, no, no room for it. Um, work at um, one of the great clinics, the Maudsley or the um, um, any of the other great clinics, you know, would have been of interest to me. So what do you... Because I'm involved at the moment with the administration of psychology being on the board, I'm aware of the fact that 80% of, of our population have no access to psychology. Now, the board is now licensing um, li uh, registered counsellors, um, people with a, a lesser training, who are probably going to do quite a lot of good. There's a, a shortage of, of, of practical-level counselling available to black people. The board's been interested in it. It hasn't made as much progress as we would have liked. That's putting it as, in a nice way. Um, from the time that I started six years ago with the board um, until now, there's been virtually no registered councillors turned out. Um, there's been no government posts for them um, and all that sort of thing. So there's a, um, in short, there's a shortage of this facility and very little effort being made by the government to make the money available to provide it. Um, 
clinical psychology is a discipline of the middle classes. Industrial psychology is, is the property of the employer. So the employee, he might get something. I mean, we always taught counseling as part of our industrial psychology course. But um, by and large, the industrial psychologist is more involved with the needs of the employer than with the employee. So I think there's an enormous amount of help that people should get that they don't get. I mean, I know from my own experience of people who come to me, people who I know who come to me about themselves, about their friends, about so-and-so, who need, who could do a certain amount of counselling, and when they hear those 450 rands an hour, they say, I haven't got that sort of money. And the medical aids may not pay for more than five or ten sessions. I think the registered counsellor's solution is good enough. People with three to four years behind them, you don't need the whole gamut of clinical psychology. They should be able to refer people up. When I was running the counselling and careers unit at WITS, we ended up with 12 people, on the, 15 people on the staff, of whom about five were, were psychologists. We had clinical, industrial, counselling psychologists. We had a, a social worker. But the other people who are in training or um, less qualified had hadn't finished their degrees, they knew, they were encouraged to know where their limits lay. We had a, a Wednesday, the whole of a Wednesday morning was, was, was dedicated to a case study and we'd say, I don't think you should go on with Joe Soap, I think he should go over to somebody. And we'll organise the transfer gently in some way. Now that's one example. At these clinics, which I imagine rural clinics and clinics in the black townships, um, as one example, you could have quite a lot of people who are supervised by more experienced people who would give them help at um, uh, case studies, that sort of thing. But not just the blacks, it's a lot of white people have not got the sort of money required for clinical help. One of the biggest changes in my lifetime, I think, is a lot of people are aware that, that counselling and therapy could help them, which they weren't 40 years ago. Um, but they still can't afford it. In Britain, the National Health Service um, psychological services are stretched. I know they're stretched to the utmost, but they're there. You can, in the end, get an appointment. Three months hence, but you can get an appointment. Yeah.